This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. The release of director Matt Reeves' The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson, is imminent. If Warner Media deems it sufficiently successful upon release, it will launch a trilogy of its own, as well as a number of spin-offs on HBO Max, all of which is set to take place in its own separate continuity and universe, isolated from all other DC projects. But this wasn't always the plan. At an earlier point in the development of what would become The Batman, it was intended to be fully integrated into the rest of the DC Universe, and it was to star Ben Affleck, who would also write the script and direct. Had the Ben Affleck iteration of the movie ended up getting made, it would have made for a very different film than the one we are getting, and one that would have been sure to please the fans of the video game Batman Arkham Asylum at that. So what happened? Why are we getting the Robert Pattinson movie instead? Stay till the end, and you will find out. In this video, we will go through what Ben Affleck's Batman movie would have been like, what precipitated the fall of Ben Affleck's Batman and the rise of Robert Pattinson's Batman, and finally, what the future may hold for Robert Pattinson's The Batman. But first, we'll share a message from this video sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. It's my go-to epic fantasy adventure game, and you should check it out too, on either iOS, Android, or PC, using the link in the description or the on-screen QR code. We have a new boss to highlight for you, namely the Guardian of the Void Key, Malik Kabar. Once a priest of the light, he was evicted from his order after he found darkness and he has a sizable supply of Void Potions to go with it, and these are potions you need to ascend your champions with. Alas, he is not giving them up without a fight, and he has no qualms about doling out poison damage to your champions. His poison debuffs can't be blocked or resisted, so to defeat him, you'll need strategy, as well as shield buffs and healing to counteract the damage. Raids got a ton happening this month, with a fresh rotation of the Brutal Hydra boss, and a ton of events and tournaments every single day, including some special Valentine's Day events where you can get your hands on a brand new Legendary Champion. What I'm saying is, this is the best time to get started in Raid, and if you click the link in the description, or scan the on-screen QR code, you'll get some cool bonuses. We're talking a free champion, namely Vargis. 200k silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in-game. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. Do note, however, that this offer is only available for new players, and only for the next 30 days. So use the QR code, or click the link in the description now, and we'll see you in the game. We'd like to thank Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. And with that, let's get back to the story of the two very different Batmen. To fully appreciate what went down behind the scenes of Batman, we have to travel almost a decade back in time to the summer of 2013. Prior to the release of the Christopher Nolan produced and Zack Snyder directed Man of Steel, the then head honchos of Warner were certain they had another The Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises level hit on their hands. Head honcho Jeff Robinov even predicted to the trades that Man of Steel would be their highest grossing movie yet, which meant it would have to top the $1.3 billion Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 had collected and he went a long way towards implying that the movie grossing anything less than a billion would be a disappointment. He would come to regret putting those numbers out there, as Man of Steel only grossed 650 million by the time all was said and done. Objectively, that is not a bad number for a franchise reboot where the previous soft reboot Superman Returns had failed to launch just a few years earlier. But there is no spinning it when the studio in advance had made it publicly known that the internal bar for success was 1 billion. Not happy with the discrepancy between expectation and reality, Warner then mandated Zack Snyder scrap his plans for Man of Steel Part 2 and instead bring in the big gun, namely Batman, and conjure a Batman and Superman movie which would make them a billion. 
Snyder complied with Warner's requests, and in August of 2013, Ben Affleck was announced as the new Batman to co-star alongside Henry Cavill's Superman in the movie that would become Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. At the time, Ben Affleck was one of the hottest stars in Warner's stable. In the years prior to his casting as Batman, he had long since left the G. Lee period behind and proven himself not just as an actor, but as a writer and director as well. And sometimes he would do all of that within one movie, with great success. When Snyder cast him in Batman v Superman, it wasn't just because they wanted him for ensemble pieces like Batman v Superman and Justice League, which is all he was originally contracted for, but so that he, further down the line, could be contracted for a series of Batman solo movies as well. In October of 2014, one year after Affleck was announced as having been cast as Batman, Warner also announced they were indeed developing a solo Batman movie with him, alongside 10 other DC movies. In accordance with direct instructions from Warner executives, the strategy of the then regime at DC Films, the Snyder regime, was that in order to catch up to the MCU, they would go straight from Batman v Superman to Justice League and from Justice League into solo movies. Hence, the Batman v Superman post credit scene would set up Justice League, while the Justice League post credit scene would set up, among other things, Ben Affleck's solo Batman movie, which he was scheduled to both star in as well as to write and direct. Please note that we have not read the script Affleck was developing ourselves, but we have heard sufficient reports, albeit many of them second-hand, that we can relay at the very least the gist of the story that Ben Affleck was going for. As set up in the theatrical Justice League's post credit scene, the movie would feature Joe Manganiello's Deathstroke as the main villain. The story would be exceedingly dark, with Deathstroke having learned from Lex Luthor that Bruce Wayne and Batman are one and the same, taking revenge on Batman for a perceived past transgression by dismantling Bruce Wayne's life from the inside out, killing everyone close to him. To this end, and on top of everything else, he would also orchestrate that Batman once again had to brutally fight scores of classic villains he had already locked up in Arkham. From what we have been told, the story was influenced by the hit video game Batman Arkham Asylum, while the warehouse fight scene in Batman v Superman is indicative of the kind of action we would have seen. In terms of sheer level of intensity, we have heard that what Affleck wanted to do could be compared with Carl Urban's Dread and director Gareth Edwards similarly themed The Raid Redemption. Many familiar with the project have claimed that if made, it would have been among the best Batman movies of all time. So why wasn't it made? Like with Man of Steel before, the Warner executives expected Batman v Superman to gross 1 billion, and they were confident it would. Zack Snyder had given them the movie they instructed him to make, he had run every major creative decision by them, and when the movie had screened for the executives, they had reportedly given it a standing ovation. What could go wrong? Well, for starters, both the executives and Snyder's team had misunderstood the issues audiences had with Man of Steel, so inadvertently they had doubled down on them. Also, the cut of the movie that Warner executives reportedly gave that standing ovation to was the Snyder Cut of Batman v Superman, which was later released on home media under the moniker The Ultimate Edition. However, the executives felt this cut was too long for a theatrical release, so they cut it down by half an hour for the public. While that facilitated more screenings, it did not lead to any more audiences attending them. The theatrical cut was arguably still too long, but all the missing footage meant the narrative was all out of whack. After a strong start, word of mouth caused the movie to tank in its second weekend, ending its run at 870 million, a far cry away from the billion that the studio had wanted. However, all upcoming movies were scheduled to be cut from the same cloth as Batman v Superman, and that caused the Warner executives to have a major freakout. 
Despite Snyder having given them the movie they wanted, and having cleared every major creative decision with them in advance, the executives blamed him. In the months that followed, Snyder was removed from his position as the de facto architect of DC on film, eventually replaced by Jeff Johns and producer John Berg. Their mandate was to chart out a new direction for DC on film, and to shift the tone, story and characterization away from the Snyderverse. The first priority of the Johns and Berg regime was retooling the in-production Justice League by bringing in Joss Whedon. The second priority was overhauling all other productions in development, in order to de-Snyderify them as much as possible. Few projects were as directly affected by this as Ben Affleck's Batman. Movies like Aquaman and Shazam were always more adjacent and didn't require any major changes outside of color palette. But Affleck's Batman movie was the direct continuation of the very Snyder saga that Johnson Berg had been mandated to shift DC on films away from. This was when rumors started making the rounds in the blogosphere that Ben Affleck was having difficulties writing the script. However, later claims emanating from behind the scenes allege that those rumors were leaked in a deliberate attempt to distract from the fact that Ben Affleck and Jeff Johns weren't seeing eye to eye on the fundamentals of what kind of movie to make. By later accounts, Affleck's script was great and ready to go. The issue was that it had been developed under the Snyder regime, and the Johnson Berg regime had no interest in pursuing the direction it took, as it built on the earlier Snyder movies. Reportedly, Johns had another script in mind altogether, one loosely based on the comic book storyline Batman Year 2, with elements of Year 1, and this script called for a much younger Batman than Ben Affleck. In many ways, that was the real crux of the matter. The Johnson Berg regime didn't merely want to go with another script than Affleck's script, they wanted to go with another Batman period, as they allegedly saw Affleck as a holdover, too intrinsically linked to the earlier Snyder regime. The public backlash over Batman v Superman, the misery of the Justice League retooling and reshoots, as well as the lack of studio support and his private life falling apart on top of it all, reportedly led to Ben Affleck quietly behind the scenes accepting Johns and Burke's invitation to leave the role. At this time, however, the Joss Whedon retooled Justice League had not yet been released, and if it had been leaked that the producers were actively looking for a new Batman, then that might have undercut the movie's box office potential. Hence, the decision was made to get ahead of the story and play a pantomime to the public. On January 30th of 2017, Deadline Hollywood were provided with the story that Ben Affleck had dropped out of directing the Batman movie, along with a statement which was credited to Affleck, but which in reality had been drafted by the studio's marketing department. It read, There are certain characters who hold a special place in the hearts of millions. Performing this role demands focus, passion, and the very best performance I can give. It has become clear that I cannot do both jobs to the level they require. Together with the studio, I have decided to find a partner in a director who will collaborate with me on this massive film. Before I continue the quote, let me interject. Just remember, at this time, Ben Affleck was already out and his script was not happening. I am still in this, and we are making it, but we are currently looking for a director. I remain extremely committed to this project and look forward to bringing this to life for fans around the world." The Deadline exclusive also stated, Affleck and Warner will now begin searching for a new director. Sources say there is a shortlist and that War for the Planet of the Apes Helmer Matt Reeves is among those on the list. In reality, there was no real shortlist, only backup candidates, as allegedly Matt Reeves, a bad robot alum, was already the chosen director. The whole purpose of releasing this story was to enter formal talks with him, so he could sign the dotted line, start reworking Jeff Johns' preferred Batman Year 2 script to fit his vision, and begin the search for a new Batman.
Matt Reeves took his time, but in late May of 2019, Robert Pattinson was officially cast as the new Batman. While the public still associated him with Sparkly the Vampire from the Twilight movies, he had successfully relaunched himself in the eyes of the industry, taking on a number of smaller but more challenging roles. Still, his success from Twilight, or more accurately, his following from Twilight, did play a role in his casting. There are persistent rumors claiming that at one point, Kristen Stewart was considered for the role of Catwoman, although the role was eventually given to Zoe Gravitz. The movie itself is a complete reboot, and it takes place in a separate continuity where none of the events seen in the earlier DC films ever transpired. In this sense, Matt Reeves' Batman is taking the same approach to Batman that Christopher Nolan did, with the notable difference that the Reeves film is tonally more influenced by Taxi Driver and David Fincher's Seven and Zodiac, while Bruce Wayne, now an addict for vengeance, is molded after Kurt Cobain. Matt Reeves' The Batman sets up a trilogy, and two HBO Max spin-off series are planned, one centered around this continuity's Gotham PD, as well as one following the exploits of The Penguin. More spin-offs may also be on the table, but as of the making of this video, nothing has been formally greenlit. As director Matt Reeves himself told Esquire magazine, it all depends on how this movie will be received by audiences, i.e. at the box office. We don't know where the threshold for success lies, but according to entertainment journalist and scooper Mikey Sutton of Geekosity magazine, Warner are, at the very least, hoping for a billion at the box office. If the movie exceeds or comes close enough to that, expect Robert Pattinson to be Batman for many years to come. If it doesn't, well, the Johnson-Berg regime were ousted after their Joss Whedon retooled Justice League tanked. How long the current Hamada regime will last, now with Warner Media soon being transferred to Discovery, is anyone's guess. By the time the dust settles, there might not be any executives left that have a stake in this movie. If it is to spawn sequels, it will have to prove to the next regime that it is financially viable. Do you think this movie will succeed where both Man of Steel and Batman v Superman failed? Are you excited about Robert Pattinson taking on the Batman, or would you have preferred to see Ben Affleck's Batman movie instead? Let us know in the comments. And before you go, remember, if you're new to Raid Shadow Legends, then use either the QR code on screen or the link in the description to collect your exclusive offer. It is only valid for 30 days though, so join in on the fun now.